With the American English adaptation on the unknown horizon, I figured enough time has passed since the sequel's release that I could discuss themes, elements, and more related to the movies set in the same universe as the critically acclaimed Train to Busan. And believe me, Train to Busan is in my top five movies of all time. I even made a video discussing why it's a perfect zombie movie. But with every wildly creative and great piece of cinema, there always has to come one thing. Certain like a definitive causality within reality. The concept of milk in the fridge franchise through a lukewarm sequel. Don't get me wrong, this isn't the first movie connected to the Train to Busan universe as we got an animated prequel film called Soul Station. And while it was a decent flick that I'll cover on this channel at some point, it didn't quite garner the attention and hype that a direct live action sequel to the OG movie would do. And boy oh boy did this sequel end up as a <clears throat> train wreck. And why is that? From cartoonish villains to weird motives to shallow characters to overuse of CGI and forgetful zombie moments. Well, you clicked the video, so today we are discussing Peninsula, Train to Busan's disappointing sequel. Peninsula was announced back in 2019. I was beyond excited for it and openly displayed my enthusiasm at this verse getting some expansion. I was also hesitant as the first movie had a niche idea that was executed quite well. Then the trailers released and just from the get-go did the plot visuals and themes of Peninsula already have my hesitation led to disappointment. It was obvious the sequel would have nowhere near the identity of the first film. It went from a claustrophobic condensed thrill ride of what the zombie apocalypse was creating to a generic post-apocalyptic setting that feels like it was turned out by American Hollywood bigwigs checking all the boxes of a successful summer blockbuster movie. I have no doubt in my mind that the think tanks in Hollywood that decided they wanted to do an American remake of Train to Busan didn't want to make an English version for any of the reasons that made it popular in the first place. No, I'm sure it was purely because the zombies act in a similar way to those in World War Z, and that movie made a killing. Even though it's largely forgettable with only Brad Pitt's name alongside Inception horns on top of zombies carrying the film. But do films like that ever have you remember the plot or the people in it? Train to Busan's characters felt genuine. They made both rational choices and or selfish ones that benefited their or someone else's own survival. They felt like real people. Saku was so selfishly obsessed with himself and his work that when a crisis arrives, starts to make less selfish decisions as it goes in order to protect his daughter and those around him. Yan Suk, the business executive that only holds himself to importance and using fear-mongering on other scared people to keep himself safe. Gui Hua, the homeless man that everyone thinks is insane or gross, but ends up being kinder than most. Sang Hua, the indomitable father-to-be who tackles adversity head-on and embodies the meaning of sacrifice and strength. And Su Wan, the straightforward daughter who speaks unfiltered like most children her age, who gives Sa Kwu the motivation to become a better man and a better father. And while I would love to talk more about the depth of each character and how it intertwines with the plot, we need to move on, but if you want to see my full discussion on that, check out my video, Why Train to Busan is a Perfect Zombie Movie. But each scene fed into another as the train made its way to Busan. As the transport progresses, an on-rails narrative if you will, so does the evolution of sa -Kwu, as he attempts to get his daughter to safety before ultimately learning what it truly means to be a father. Sacrifice. The original film had suspense built up, thanks to the zombies and actions of others while also making you care about the survivors put into those precarious positions. It can even bring a tear to your eye when they meet their end. And what sucks about Peninsula is that none of that is retained into the sequel that presents itself as some kind of continuation. Much like how Back for Blood loved to slap from the creators of Left 4 Dead on itself, Peninsula did the same, with all promotional material and even titles saying, Saying, Train to Busan presents Peninsula, as if the movie couldn't carry itself on its own and new people would go into the zombie flick if connected to Train to Busan. And while the movie was released in the middle of the COVID pandemic, the movie would make less than half of what its predecessor did in the box office, despite spending twice as much of the budget as the original movie. Now, it's been over three years since its release, and I don't see people talking about Peninsula much except talking about how they were disappointed, what went wrong, what in the story slash concept 
concept fell flat. Well, let's go through the key points, elements, characters, environments in the story as the movie progresses and see why it did not work as a Busan sequel. We have an opening scene on an evacuation boat that has an infected man somehow get on board and infect a large portion of South Korean evacuees on board, much in the same vein as the Train to Busan. But in Train to Busan, it actually made sense that an infected host was able to get on board without detection, as knowledge of the outbreak was completely unknown to everyone on board at that time. In Peninsula's intro, this was an evacuation attempt led by South Korean and US armies. Vetting every person on board should have been mandatory for carrying hundreds of civilians since the virus spread so damn fast. This intro is an attempt at making a parallel to the movie this film is hinting itself on, a not-so-effective boat to Hong Kong that has a soldier lose his sister and nephew to the horde as sad music plays. Yet, we can't really feel an emotional attachment like we did with the passengers of the train because there's no time or development there. It is all just forced like it's trying to make you cry but without any of the substance up to that point. Maybe if this evacuation boat was explored more and given proper reason to its own outbreak, maybe this would have been decent enough to be the focal point of a sequel. However, that was not the case as we instead get American talk show hosts going over how South Korea Korea was permanently quarantined by the rest of the civilized world. And because of North Korea's heavily armed border, the country of South Korea would be landlocked, turning it into a nameless peninsula within four years. Which that concept right there is really neat. But after that speed run of the dumb and sad boat massacre, surely we could get something just as gripping that made Train to Busan special amidst a sea of so many generic zombie films out there for the rest of the film, right? I have to give it to the studio, they did not make a generic zombie movie. They made a generic heist action movie with zombies in a semi-decently explored world that focuses way more on badass scenes than story. They must have consulted Zack Snyder since Army of the Dead was basically made around the same time frame, stemming from a money heist in a location long overrun by zombies. Yep, that's right, the soldier from the boat Zhang Xiaok is contracted by Chinese mobsters to go back to South Korea. Korea to retrieve $20 million from an armored truck. But for as much as I can praise semi-decent zombie concepts, having the focus be a heist with an A-team to get some cash, and then all hell breaking loose once money, insane groups, tech-savvy families, and hordes of undead get involved just cries out as an antithesis to the original movie's intent. Going from a character-driven focus study on the greed, angers, fears, and true nature of humanity that has you behind the main cast and don't know who or if anyone will survive to a generic action plot where you can tell how things will play out most likely and are mainly there for flash and not substance. We get a glimpse of how the world views South Koreans and how people view them as pariahs that could get other people infected and countries quarantined making people of South Korean descent and appearance considered modern-day lepers. Sadly, we only get about 15 seconds of that narrative before it's wholeheartedly forgotten and abandoned. The main objective of this film is basically outsiders going in to get money and people that have stayed inside either resenting the people that have come due to their greedy endeavors into hell or using them to get out of hell either via the funds or via the escape route. Of course, the idea that $2.5 million for each person involved would change their lives and bring them out of their unachievable, broken, poor refugee status. But money is an easy narrative tool for any character to strive for, ranging from wanting a better life for yourself and others to pure greed and wanting things you don't need. Money heists make for a way of delivering a character's goals simply without having to flesh them out too much. Everyone has heard the old proverb, money is the root of all evil, time and time again. So to have that be the main plot device just seems kind of lazy. So, what is the plan for the current main cast to achieve this heist? The idea to retrieve the money from a mock bridge is to go late at night since the zombies are practically blind in the dark. It makes for a sensible idea that lends to the dynamic of this brand of zombie. Every character knows their reliance on light and sensitivity to sound. They know what it means to survive against these types of undead. And the Chinese mobsters even blatantly state that Don't screw up trying to save each other for nothing. 
It's as if they had watched Train to Busan and saw that sacrifice was a main theme. So they are directly telling the audience to not save others and to not let emotions get in the way. While that is a stoic and real statement, for this sequel it feels forced to feed the audience the idea instead of letting it flow naturally via the story. You know there's going to be sacrifice. You know there's going to be emotions getting in the way to save others people. Well, they land ashore in the middle of the night, even though it is way too bright for the setting. If you're going to be going for a dark and brooding environment, why make it look like it's late in a cloud-covered day? It's like they were just like, we're just going to make things look blue, not dark. We get a cool looking shot of a horde of zombies being crammed into a glass building being revealed by the moonlight. But so much about the idea of this shot does not make sense. Why wouldn't this massive horde have already broken the glass? Why are they crammed in a fragile containment in the first place? How is this such a reveal from the dark when there is barely any dark to begin with? It felt like a cheap jump scare. And if there's one thing that makes a horror movie less engaging to me, it's cheap jump scares! They're able to find a car, jumpstart it, and easily cruise through the ruins of the Incheon metropolitan city. As I've said many times before in my zombie sense for any long-term zombie apocalypse, I don't know how they have a working battery in gasoline, but hey, we aren't here for total realism, are we? They find the truck and it's bound to harvest as they are spied on by a girl. They find the driver is still in the driver's seat, only dead. Chul Min tries to pry him out, only for the zombie to wake up. Yet another jump scare that could be seen miles away, even though having a zombie sitting there for four years does not make a lick of sense. Despite these people knowing how zombies work, they blatantly don't check to see if the first dead body they have seen at all is alive or not. This puts them all in danger and causes the car horn to sound off, drawing zombies from all over Incheon. Car alarms spurred by gunshots and moving trucks cause more zombies to appear as they make their getaway. We're getting a lot of action as soon as they make landfall. Isn't that cool? Well, the celebration would only be cut short when mysterious figures fire off flares to distract the group and attract more undead to their location. The preceding confusion leads to a massive wreck, killing two of the crew, or at least one of them, and leaving Jung Seok injured as he flies out a window, and Shul Min abandoned in the moving truck. How they even got into this wreck in the first place to cause the main character Mario and Luigi divide in this movie movie is purely stupid, seeing as how they just stopped to gawk at some flares? Don't you want to take the money and run? So they thrust themselves into this predicament by acting this way in the first place, just so the plot can happen. Again, making it to where it doesn't feel like real people. What follows is the worst sin this movie by far has done for me. I am not a car guy. I'm not going to sit there and jack off to cars getting really loud. I am not into cars whatsoever. I'm the zombie guy. Regardless, we're going to go full throttle into that sentiment I said earlier of all flash and no substance, and this movie basically becomes fast and furious, but with zombies. Jung Seok, cornered by encroaching undead forces, is saved by a speeding vehicle, driven by sisters Elder Jun and the younger Yu Jin. These two sisters have the generic dynamic of badass older sibling and younger kid who delivers comedic, diffusing one-liners. Basically, they are there to fill cookie-cutter roles that feel like they're straight out of a Marvel film. They speed off and away as Jun treats the next segment of the movie as a need-for-speed race. Everything about this car driving scene just drives me up a wall. Crash zoom effects with wipe sounds, main character goofily pinballing around the back of the car, badass girl perfectly driving around apocalyptic debris and undead like it's nothing. Which if you think about it, how the hell did she learn to drive that in the four years of a zombie apocalypse where they could just easily break through anything? All of this while Spanish flamenco guitar music is playing? What about any of this scene or setting set in South Korea with Asian characters from China, South Korea, and other neighboring countries paired with an action scene like it's from an American Hollywood movie obsessed with cars? Screams Spanish flamenco guitar. This all culminates in the older sister Tokyo drifting over dozens of zombies, narrowly down the tight corridors of Incheon alleyways as sparks fly, showcasing how the CGI for the hordes of zombies just looks 
bad, especially for a movie with twice the budget of its last. Hell, the horde scenes in Train to Busan didn't look anywhere near this horrible. The grandiose style of these action sequences makes the use of CGI more frequent and a lot more apparent. Since Peninsula is more action focused, it needs, it has a need for more horde scenes and more action scenes, leading to the need for more special effects, making each use of those CGI portions very distracting. But the sisters are able to get away only to be barricaded by zombies in the dark. Younger sister Eugen deploys her remote controlled AC filled with lights and sounds to distract the zombies away and get her toy back. The ingenuity displayed by this girl is cute and charming, don't get me wrong, but leaves me feeling like it was a girl written to just be any kind of person that can use cool gadgets and not serve any other purpose besides being that kind of character, the gizmo character. Regardless, it does get them to safety as they retreat back Back to their apartment. Meanwhile, Chul Min, cornered inside the moving truck, has a horde deterred away from his location by a brightly lit and loud stripper truck. From there, the antagonists of the film roll in to pick up the scraps of the people they just ambushed. Known as Unit 631, a band of military rescue personnel abandoned during the mass exodus have taken over and made this part of South Korea their own lawless, brutal sector. The driver's seat opens up to find one of the crew survived, only to have been bitten and badly injured. One of the leads of the evil faction, Sergeant Huang, enters into frame by his cocky boots, ruthlessly slaughtering the man with a crazed demeanor as he devilishly smiles, latent with yellow teeth. It's always obvious when someone is evil in a film when they have bad dental hygiene. It's in your face and direct about the antagonistic persona of this film from the get-go, whereas Train's antagonist Yon Suk was more of just a man that blends it in with the fearful crowd who was so greedy and scared to die that he threw anyone under the bus. They haul off the vehicle with Chul Min inside, and then we transition back to the apartment where we see the family of four bringing in Jung Suk. The grandfather, Elder Kim, is attempting to reach the United Nations to arrange a rescue while the main girl and mother of the sisters Min Jung confronts Jung Suk over why he is here in the first place. It is then he realizes this is the same mother he left before as he was driving to the escape boat at the very start of the movie. Small world, huh? He admits the reason he is there is the ass load of cash in a truck, prompting Min Jung to be baffled at the first outsiders to come in ages are for money. Now, at a compound of survivors, Unit 6 631's third platoon celebrates their haul of a box truck, despite not knowing what's inside whatsoever. Huang believes they deserve more rations and threatens Private Kim over them. The truck is open to find Chul Min inside, with every single person in the unit suddenly becoming excited and taking him away, while Kim discovers the duffel bags full of money. Wouldn't you be more concerned about what's in the truck, like there might be in food or other valuable resources that you need to know about? Private Kim runs off to his boss, where we first see Captain So, who fills the main antagonist role of the film, a cowardly leader who keeps to himself and spends his first scene nearly killing himself, showing his selfish nature. When he hears of all the cash, his careless demeanor quickly shifts, despite Kim believing the money to be worthless. Discovering the left-behind satellite phone, he calls the mobsters and sets up an evac time to escape with the cash. This character swiftly already taking over the mission when the villains are just introduced without any buildup, feels like it's just happening to move the plot forward, to have the captain portray his platoon so there can be some kind of buildup for the action and climax. Also, it can be a four-way brawl to the finish line between the good, family, the bad, the captain, the ugly, Unit 631, and the dead. Well, that one's self-explanatory. This movie makes it flagrantly obvious what intentions each person has and how there is no dimension beyond that. Characters in Train to Busan were ambiguous in their design when introduced, but were fleshed out to show their true colors. Versus Peninsula, where each character is instantly discernible in their purpose. It feels both rushed in character development, but also taking forever to move on with the plot because this is almost a two hour long movie. Chul Min is forced to participate in a barbaric game. His bare chest is spray painted with a number and thrown in a holding area with other participants. We see the full scope of how much South Korea
Korea has deteriorated. The devolvement of those that remain holding sporting events pinning prisoners against zombies to see who can survive, betting their rations and basic supplies. You know, it's a cool concept. The shot of the infected all bound together is good promotional footage, I guess, and it's nice to see them not being CGI. But the zombies are really just kind of jumping crickets in the background compared to what's actually going on. But you know, seeing how organized 631 is in this one avenue of just putting together a sporting event is a great example of how fucked their priorities are. How this inhuman act is their only enjoyment while barely scraping by every day by everyone else. If only the rest of the movie had this kind of interesting depth. Hatching a plan, the family decides the best course of action is to steal the truck for themselves and escape via Inchian Port, knowing they will have to pit themselves against Unit 631 potentially. Jung Seok, feeling guilty for his past, admits to Min Jung he abandoned her on the day of evacuation. She states 31 other people did the same to her and he shouldn't worry about it and should honestly pay himself off to the girls, declaring to us that in times of crisis, people won't help one another. And to press on Jung Suk and more importantly the audience that you can be different than the scared masses if you just be brave. Another idea kind of ham-fisted into the viewer. It would have been fine if the flashbacks to abandoning her were kept to himself to leave some ambiguity on his intentions or his goals, to show his everlasting guilt at those he left behind considering the living conditions for every person that was stuck in South Korea up until this point. Or even more so if the woman he abandoned before was someone else entirely that looked similar to Min Jung but his guilt made him believe it was her to drive him more to save her and to help those he abandoned. Instead, we get dialogue laying things out plainly to say people are evil and fearful, so that there's clearly defined goals for everyone. The discourse between these two is mainly so the woman can bring up owing her girls to the guy over and over and again jabbing us with what his goals should be and telling him and the audience what this is all for. Taking the car out, the mother tells her daughter and father to stay in the vehicle in an alleyway as mommy and daddy infiltrate a terrorist compound. I'd say leaving behind your children and an elderly man in a semi-open area in apocalyptic scenario is not the best idea. However, it's night and they have Fast and Furious brand plot armor, Family Edition. Family. Min Jung knows exactly how to sneak into their fortress via a parking garage since she and the family had lived in the base for a time but escaped to avoid their tyrannical rule. But that does not explain why the outer perimeter is widely unguarded with only one person to insta-KO. They are able to tiptoe through the base undetected and are able to find the truck in the first few minutes of being there. Wouldn't this truck that's the movie MacGuffin be more tightly guarded considering Captain So sees it as a a get out of jail free card and the rest of the unit is told that it has enough food to last them a month? Wouldn't some of these people just kind of sneak into the truck to pick at the food or be hauling the food in or anything else? Speaking of which, Captain So, in order to distract everyone to execute his escape, tells them they are going to celebrate with a 24-hour unlimited game. A sudden burst in generosity from the captain that was barely giving out rations before. Detecting irregularities in the captain's behavior, Sergeant Huang confronts him in his office. Since So had barely given out supplies before, it was odd for him to allow non-stop fun and food for a little bit out of the blue, and even finding the captain's private stash of black label liquor, showing he had valuable secrets he was withholding from everyone else. Huang interrogates him thinking something is up. When Private Kim walks in, Captain So prepares a pistol to kill the sergeant. However, Huang merely discerns this secrecy is only so that Kim and So can have sex? Huang leaves without any more suspicion when coming to this conclusion. The whole confrontation really makes their dynamic of chaotic evil versus neutral evil really fall flat. Huang finding the booze was good symbolism 
home of the captain's greed as he hid valuable resources from the rest of his men. But having distrust that apparently had been rising between these two since the start of the outbreak be suddenly quelled almost instantly over a gay joke just feels lazy. It's just briefly there to show us, yep, they don't like each other and they will definitely be against each other later. Jung Sok and Min Jung get to the box truck and find one of the two satellite phones is destroyed. At the same time, Private Kim walks up to deliver an exposition dump to the both of them to inform them that he and Captain So know of the excursion from Incheon Port because of the satellite phone the captain procured. On top of that, two guards walk up to inform Kim that the wild dog they got from the box truck earlier is a formidable contestant in their games and that he is barely struggling to survive. Telling the main character Jong Suk his friend is indeed alive and can be saved. Really coming full circle with that whole don't screw up trying to save each other thing from the beginning of the movie. With a, I guess, central theme is to learn to help others even if it means to sacrifice yourself. You remember the big theme from the first movie. But now it's really hitting us over the head with Jung Sok's only character trait being just this. There is nothing else to him besides redemption. In Train to Busong, Sok Wu learnt what it meant to help others through bravery and sacrifice, witnessing his evolution from the greedy hedge fund man manager who only looked out for himself to the badass who would do anything for his friends and daughter. But here, Jung Seok is just spoon-fed motivation constantly as an empty slate of guilt and a need for redemption. All of this is going on while guards notice zombies are starting to gather in the front of the base, but brush this off like it's nothing because of their minuscule numbers. Further out, the family sees hundreds of zombies marching toward the base randomly, basically here to ramp up the stakes, as most zombie movies do as the final conflict draws near. We gotta have that random horde attack once every other character's motives are fully set in motion. We do have another survival game beginning, causing a ruckus of ecstatic spectators with Chul Min exhaustively trying to survive. Outside, Min Jung demands Captain So hand over the satellite phone only for him to open fire on her. She steers the box truck in a way to goofily cause the villain to be knocked out. I don't know if we're supposed to be taking this guy seriously, but the gunfire he caused is ignored by guards inside only for Jong Seok to open fire on them and massacre them. The sound of gunfire acts as the catalyst for the rising action to begin. The zombie hear the gunfire and start to converge on the base, which doesn't make sense as there was already sounds of dozens of screaming military guys that would have attracted all these zombies already. The sound of gunfire spurs the waiting family to start driving to save the day. The sound of gunfire causes Unit 631 to freak out and start gathering their weapons and vehicles, really setting up that whole the good, the bad, the ugly, and the dead racing for the finish line thing I said earlier. Chol Min is about to be slow motion dived on by a zombie, when suddenly the ghoul is shot in the head mid-jump, revealing Jung Seok somehow got in the middle of the caged arena instantaneously without intervention by any guards or being attacked by the many other zombies there. Jung Seok earns a redemption brownie point by saving his brother-in-law and, to one-up Seok Woo from the previous film when it comes to redemption, does it in style. He throws a smoke canister into the air and shoots it so they can escape. In a Wild West kind of shooting your gun kind of thing, really flashy. This is where the annoyances of the structure of having one dude tank down a military unit makes no sense. They have obviously lived in this state for four years, but suddenly because one former military dude is having a redemption arc, he can suddenly swoop in and cause this much chaos? Jung Seok has never seen inside this compound, was never given any information on its layout or even anything about the survival games they execute. Yet he fires one flare into where the zombies are usually released from and this causes the zombies to run inside and out of their containment and break out? Didn't they have a guy earlier in the film wear flashy attire and do the same thing to draw them into the container? 
what was going on and why did one flare cause the survival game zombies to break out and start attacking Unit 631. It's to feign a sign of comeuppance for their heinous deeds, but in reality, it's an easy way for the riders to have a zombie attack and start the climactic action going on the rise. Jung retreats with Chul Min amidst the chaos avoiding lines of gunfire left and right. While Jung is pinned by a zombie, Chul Min sees a firing squad, grabs a gun, kills a few of them, and throws Jung the weapon to defend himself. As we all know, only main characters have good aim, so Captain Huang shoots Chul Min through the heart, ultimately dialing back to the don't screw up trying to save each other for nothing sentiment again. But this time, since Chul Min isn't a main character, he dies. The sight of seeing his brother-in-law die right in front of him, the whole reason his character arc spiraled in the beginning of the movie, seeing his sister die in the boat, spurs him to do what he was already doing in the first place, easily taking down every person that comes near him without taking any damage himself. Because every villain has to take their turn 1v1ing a hero. But this time, while he is killing nameless NPCs, it's set to sad and dramatic music. Luckily, before Captain Huang does the exact same thing and takes his time to aim at the good guy and kill him, the moving truck crashes through the wall exactly where he is to stop him. We cannot have the character who is learning about sacrifice to not sacrifice himself. At least not until the end or at all, because that would be too dark and depressing. Min Jung and Jung Suk drive off while Unit 631 misses every single shot against them and then go to their vehicles for the grand car chase finale. Captain So wakes up from his narratively induced nap to limp forward and kill Private Kim as he is walking away. You know, Kim, the only guy that's been helping him this whole time. Because, you know, he's evil and only cares about himself. That's the way we can portray that. So let's just have him pop the Korean golem that's been helping him. In Train to Busan, Yan suck through people into harm's way to save himself. But in Peninsula, having the villain kill the only person he basically interacted with positively was just forcing an element of he only cares about himself and he is a coward. It's like they wanted another Yan Suk, but didn't have the building blocks or time to make it work. The box truck is immediately slowed down by a horde of zombies. With the windows busted out, the zombies start swarming in, but only slowly. Zombies always respect main characters and their want to live. Thankfully, the horde takes long enough for the family to come and save them out out of nowhere once again. With the lights distracting them, the box truck mows over some of the zombies. And uh, <coughs> editor Michael, can you slow mo this to like 10%? Look at this. It looks like a video game cutscene from the latter half of the PS2's life cycle. How was this a scene done with a bigger budget than Train to Busan? What is that car model? It continues with the cars being chased by the dead and the family having perfect synergy. June drifting the car so Asian Bill can fire off fireworks into a different street to deter the horde, with the little girl serving her main purpose in the film, to be a cute character saying kiddish things to diffuse the action and give general audiences a moment to breathe and Marvel laugh. We then turn this movie into Mad Max. Unit 631 not only somehow catches up to them after all this time, but fires flares like 40 stories high as if shock troopers are being dead dropped in from the sky for an insane military squad seeking bloodthirsty revenge. Why the everlasting fuck would they even consider firing flares at these people? It's basically to make a shitty callback to when they first appeared in the movie. This is to show that they're there and they are a threat. Yes, it made sense for them to do so when hunting for supplies, but here they are literally trying to kill mobile targets in cars. Why the everlasting hell would they want to draw attention of the hordes when you can just shoot the tires on the vehicles when they are not aware of your presence? Catch them by surprise. You're a military unit that's been doing this for four years. We saw Captain Huang was cold and calculative when he was slowly taking aim at Chul Min and Jung Suk in the middle of the compound, but everything is thrown out the window for Unit 631 sensibilities because the scene demands it. That and so we can really go fully into Mad Max full throttle and have this obviously green screen shot of a dude going, Weehaw! 
We get a scene of some bumper cars that drags on for a minute, and when the car crashes, Huang now makes the call to kill them instead of firing flares. Why? Why are you dragging this out so stupidly? Why, for the first portion of all of this, was it just fire flares at them and try to knock them over? So you knock them over. What happens after that? The zombies are going to come? Are you expecting the zombies to kill them? Don't you want to kill these people yourself? And it's not like they're trying to knock the truck over to get what's inside. The characters here would not care about the contents of the truck this much as they think it's only a month's supply of food, which, don't get me wrong, that would go a long way in a zombie apocalyptic scenario. But these guys are considered to be insane and would be more concerned about killing the people that ruined their game, their base, and killed their men. A month's supply of food would pale in comparison to them wanting to get revenge. And it's not like they know this truck has a ticket off the peninsula either. But and it, it's just all circumvented as if the truck needs to not be damaged and they want to bring the people back as prisoners? Is that the point of this? Why? Unit 631 was an antagonistic entity that made no sense except to be a blank slate of evil that serves as people to shoot at and race cars with. They are literally existing just so they could be random cars that crash around the main characters randomly as if it's a racing arcade game you would see at Chuck E. Cheese back in the 1990s. And hell, the way these graphics are, it looks like one too. You know what I'm talking about, something like Cruising USA. The car chase even leads to what I call a yo moment. June, while narrowly driving the tight corridors of this market, sees zombies in night vision and does this. She Tokyo drifts again to shine light in their faces in the blink of an eye and then drives perfectly in reverse at high speeds so the zombies attack the tow truck because the light is shining on that and causes this tow truck to instantly crash. All of this so the audience can go, yo, that was sick. But really, it just makes you baffled at how cringe they are trying to make this into fucking fast and furious with zombies. How the hell did they think this is what people wanted from a Train to Busan sequel? I expect something like this from an American adaptation, but not a direct sequel from South Korea. At this point, the writers must have thought, oh yeah, I forgot, it's a zombie movie. So they have Huang, who is literally getting wrecked and starts to get salty and decides, you know what, let's have all the cars turn on some high beam lights, which causes zombies to spawn like the Left 4 Dead director told them to or something. Why would this unit pull this kind of maneuver, turning on lights in the middle of the night? Having zombies converge on your location seems extremely counterproductive. Yes, they will chase after what's ever in the light, but what happens after that? This is especially for people that know how these zombies work and have survived against them for 48 months now. I'd go on, but it's just a bunch of slop of villains aiming and not shooting main characters. They have guns, they could have been shooting them the whole time. There's a bunch of scenes where they go to aim their gun at the character and then just don't shoot. Why? Each portion of Unit 631 ends with conveniently placed hordes of zombies. First, zombies pouring off a bridge to kill the platoon, causing them to wreck. Then, if you remember the glass building from earlier where only the main character could see inside, is shot open to let out the horde that was crammed in there like sardines. You're telling me the purpose of these particular zombies from earlier were so they could be a plot convenience for the getaway? It couldn't just be a nonsensical set piece to show the underlying horror of the peninsula's inland? It had to be a tool to make a karmic retribution ending for Captain Huang, since he did use zombies as both tools of war and instruments of fun? Well, yeah, the villain dies to the zombies. There's nothing else to it. And you know what? He never directly spoke to or interacted with any of the main cast beyond just shooting bullets at him. There was nothing behind him. Hell, the dude never even had his plot point of distrusting his captain ever fleshed out. 
It literally fizzled out over a gay joke. No confrontation over wanting off the peninsula. No confrontation of why the captain was acting so weird. No going over the lesser of two evils plot point that was kind of being set up. Why the hell was Captain Huang a character in the first place? What was his purpose? He was built up to be this ravenous, bloodthirsty beast that would be a force to be reckoned with if he was betrayed or if you went against him. But he just ended up being a dude with authority that screamed a lot, made funny faces, shot one character to death, and then got in a wreck and died. Everyone else surrounding him were literally nobodies as well, just NPCs to scream and die as fodder. The whole point of Unit 631 feels like unnecessary forces filling up time in the movie, and not a single one of the band of soldiers felt crucial to the story. It's literally just blank slate soldiers that could have been in any other scenario and didn't even need zombies. Speaking of insignificant characters, Captain So somehow outspeeds every one of the speeding cars to be the one car that's waiting at the docks to crash into the family before they could make it. The guy that just before the epic Mad Max car chase could barely walk or function and is now able to drive, maneuver past a city of zombies to just creepily park and hope the truck, the meal ticket to get off this peninsula, comes by. But then if you think about it, he hits a random car that's going by. It might have made sense if it was the box truck that he saw, because, you know, that has all the money that's required to escape with the Chinese Mafia. Hell, the car that was driving there could have easily been one of his own platoon that did not know shit about the rendezvous with the Chinese Mafia that he was betraying them over, and, you know, if that happened, he would have had to explain why he was there and willing to crash into them. Yeah, he was willing to shoot others, but they are well more armed than he is. The dazed and confused captain takes June is a hostage and starts rambling about how he can start a new life in Hong Kong and how no one will know the atrocities he committed on the peninsula. Only one thing, this doesn't make sense for his character. Captain So literally sat in his office barking orders apparently for most of these four years. It was mostly the unit doing all the heinous acts. He was just being lazy and a coward. He literally hasn't done anything except betray his unit and kill Kim which nobody knew about except him. If any character deserved to have the moment of confessing his sins, it would be Sergeant Huang, the guy that actually did a lot of shit. But because So is the only one in the know, and because he is a mirror version coward of Yan Suk from Train to Busan, we have to have the last minute, I don't want to die. Please let me trauma dump and dream like a child. This is what I'll do if I don't ever be evil again, I promise. Coward moment. But the little kid drives her her remote control car to remind us that was her gimmick and distract the captain. Because of this, he proceeds to shoot Korean Bill in the back and the mom in the leg and then take the truck to the mafia boat. Upon arrival, the Chinese mobsters shoot his ass, showing this was ultimately the fate of anyone that would have showed up with the money. What an M. Night Shyamalan twist! If this didn't involve the Chinese mafia in the first place, that could have been seen a mile away. Of course, of course they're gonna kill anyone that has the money. This is a completely discreet operation involving 20 million dollars. They are not gonna split two and a half million with your ass. Captain So, in his sinful gesture of greed, was paid back sanctimoniously. While the irony is thick and the themes are lukewarm, it does not feel earned as this character barely got any screen time to earn this comeuppance. He was literally this. Point A, I'm sick of living here, I wanna die. Point B, boy howdy, there's a way off the peninsula, fuck everyone else. Point C, I made it, oop, I'm dead. He literally dies because he got to the finish line first. What kind of morality is this? The tortoise and the hare breaking bad edition? The mafia does not secure the vehicle and as so dies, puts the truck in reverse and slams the gas, breaking the ramp that blockaded the passengers from the undead and causing the zombies to kill all the villains of the movie. Yay! Evil doesn't win at all! Though you would think a 20 million dollar dead drop would have a lot more security and assurance when it comes to going into a land infested with creatures that can infect you with one bite. Hell, this guy didn't even shoot so in the head 
with him looking like he was probably bitten with how bloody he was. But hey, at least we get the moral of the story. What is that moral? Well, it's so easy, a caveman can do it. It is, money is the root of all evil, yay, woo, wow, wowie, zowie, Whoa. Also, Grandpa dies from his gunshot wound. But as he leaves this mortal coil, his work to communicate with the United Nations finally worked with the helicopter dropping in at the dock, sacrificing his life for his family, despite really not doing anything except being a goofy old person that talked on radios and fired some fireworks. I mean, he did put on a military hat like Left 4 Dead's Bill, but there was nothing else to that. Was he a former soldier? I don't know. He was just there to contact the outside world so there would be an alternate escape route from the mafia so that main characters could get away and then just die. He could have been a great character, but no, just off him. There is a final conflict because remember, this is a zombie movie and the horde descends upon the family thanks to the rising sun and the sounds of the helicopter. The mom sits back ready to give them covering fire as they escape thanks to her gimp leg. She avoids tons of infected like a badass, but when she gets cornered in a truck, everything comes to a halt. The zombies, despite breaking into every other villain's car before, just sit there and going, eh, eh, I'm trying to get her eh, eh, at Min Jung so she can come to the conclusion that she needs to off herself. And not only that, but she does it slowly and makes sure there is a good sightline for her children. It's as if she is wanting her kids to watch her to off herself as Major Jane and New Daddy just hold the kids there to watch. You're not going to bring them into the helicopter for safety or anything. I mean, there's hordes of undead that are still coming, but no. Watch, kids. Your mom is about to make her own head disappear. Look! Look! Look at it! Major Jane literally says this to the kids. She made a very sensible decision. It was for the best. For everyone. Oh my god, woman. This chick is about to end herself in front of her own kids. Why are you having this pep talk with them right now as you're holding them in place, making them look at their mother, making them look? Oh, so Jung Seok can have a sudden flashback to the now dead Shul Min, telling him that sensible decisions when it comes to family in a zombie apocalypse are bullshit, and it will only leave you permanently mentally scarred if you do not sacrifice yourself. Forcing the idea that you do need to sacrifice yourself all it took was forcing kids to watch their mom almost kill herself. He suddenly just says screw it now because he had the flashback, like it's some kind of One Piece episode, and starts to save the mom. Fires a bullet in the air, wasting ammo by the way, and starts running back into the horde. The sound of the bullet and her daughter screaming shakes Min Jung out of it, and she is able to escape easily with Jung Suk. This time, he didn't have to sacrifice anything. Dude literally had backup too. The United Nations was there. They get back to the dock and just start hugging it out slowly and crying and just having this whole scene instead of just rushing into the helicopter and then hugging it out because, you know, there's still hordes of infected still closing in. Hurry the fuck inside, goddammit! Also, I don't know what the UN soldiers are there for since they don't do shit except stand there. They don't fire anything. They just sit there. Worse off, they don't even check anyone for bites. The UN just shows up, says, sure, let's go, and that's it. Wouldn't anyone of authority at least check? You don't want to have what happened at the start of the movie happen here, right? No? Just gonna risk a helicopter to Hong Kong sequel? Everyone cries and thinks about the shallow characters that they lost. And then you think, was anything earned for this point, for the ending? No. They all get in the helicopter, fly off into the sunset, and live happily ever after. And that's it. That's the movie. The money might be gone, but it's sunk into the depths of the sea with the evil Unit 631 and Chinese mobsters. Who needs money when you have the family and friends you made along the way? Everyone except the barely explored brother-in-law and grandfather escaped with their lives, with everyone not learning a goddamn thing. Train to Busan made me feel like anyone could go at any moment. Peninsula embodied the American action movie tradition of making you feel like the younger portions of the family were never in any real danger, as having any of the actual main characters or kids being at risk would just make you feel sad. Yeah, that's not what you're here for. You're watching a zombie movie for car chases, explosions, and 
and lots of CGI zombies flailing about. Yeah, the brother-in-law died, but you know what? He was ugly. We all know ugly people don't have a right to live in action movies unless they're the main character. Same goes for old people. They lived long enough. No need to write them to be anything else except the person that is able to help and then be the sacrificial lamb. Jung Sok apparently redeemed himself by accidentally stumbling on the woman he ignored and saving her whole family by returning to the peninsula after four years, thanks to the Chinese mafia and a promise of two and a half million dollars. That is character development right there. Not because he was motivated to help anyone, but because of plot-driven fate that involved money. Dude literally had no other draw or directly connected characters, but the writers were still too scared to kill him off. Whereas in Train to Busan, the dad of the daughter literally allows himself to get bit and fall to his death to save his own daughter, wrapping up his redemption. While his daughter Suwon had a few close calls, it was still iffy if she and the pregnant woman would survive, especially with the cliffhanger ending. The family was a family and banded together as a family to survive till they escaped as a family. There's nothing more to it except they're a family. In Peninsula, the only one of the family that dies is the elderly man because that is exactly who has to sacrifice themselves at the end of the day. The villains all died with nothing at all to say about their characters except that greed bad, karma, real. Nothing to discuss about being abandoned by the world and what it turns you into, and the intricacies of their humanity after being in lawless land for so long. Just plain monsters who only look out for themselves or their interests. Now don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with having a villain not having an overly diluted backstory to make them relatable. Hell, Disney is up our ass with that trail of narratives where there needs to be a reason for a character to be evil as if evil has to be misunderstood or broken. That is not the case. I am all for characters being evil for evil's sake. But the movie doesn't act like that. They act like there was a buildup to them being these kinds of people, but they were not. And you know what? Some people are just dicks. Train to Busan's villain Yan Suk was evil via his own self-interest, but also he was just a dick. He was scared and wanted to live at any cost while serving as an embodiment of Sok Woo's selfish side. He legitimately was a character you hated and for good reason, but explainable reason. The two villains of Peninsula are just cliff notes of how a person would be in a dead man's land, nothing else to them at all. Either afraid and ready to abandon everyone or chaotic and ready to kill and rob anyone. But both of them are not being built up to accentuate those ideas. The movie hinges on being a Train to Busan movie. There was a certain level of expectations for a lot of what had ended up being shallow or missing entirely for this flash in the pan action thrill ride that everyone quickly forgot about. The movie is longer than Train to Busan, with a larger budget and much more hype up to its release, but ultimately had a lot less less to say, if anything at all. Now before I end things here, you may have noticed that I took the route of basically explaining to you plot points in a linear flow with the movie as subjects popped up in my head, like a hybrid of my video essays and my zombie sins. When I make videos like something like Why Shaun of the Dead or Train to Busan are perfect zombie movies, I generally try to find themes to work into categories that each film accentuated and how they bounce off each other well. I don't necessarily follow the flow of the movie from point A to point B. It's more like point A to point Z to point D to point F to point G. I enjoy making video essays where I go over the plot of a movie and discuss what lies under the hood of the film's narrative, cinematography, and characters. However, with movies like this, you can't really have a meal when the main course is bare bones and hollow. Peninsula serves to be a gigantic disappointment that probably will kill any continuation of the series in its origin country of South Korea. But you know what? It's not over yet. Just over the horizon is the darkest fate for a foreign film on God's green earth. The American Adaptation. <laughs>
Thanks for watching this look into a shit sequel. Next up are the forgotten failures of George A. Romero. Special thanks to you for watching, and if you want to be featured on this list here and have your name permanently etched into future videos, feel free to be a Patreon patron or YouTube channel member by signing up on the join button below or going to patreon.com just like these awesome people. Until next time, I'm Zach S, aka Wow Such Gaming. Stay happy, stay healthy, and most importantly, stay wow.